Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join our webinar today, our first quarterly update for 2023. Information presented is for educational purposes only and does not intend to make an offer or solicitation for the sale or purchase of any specific securities, investments, or investment strategies. Investments may involve risk and unless otherwise stated are not guaranteed. So please be sure to first consult with a qualified financial advisor and or tax professional before implementing any strategies discussed. And with that out of the way, um, I guess we can jump right into uh, the agenda that we've got. So we've got a lot to unpack here. But before we dive in, I think the one of the key takeaways here uh, for this session that we'd like uh, our, our audience and our clients to, to, to go away with, which is, uh, despite a lot of the the uh, things that we have going on, whether it's in the markets and the economy as a whole, um, you know, we want to be focused on the forest and, and not miss the forest uh, from the trees. Uh, so with that out of the way, I'm going to jump uh, right in. And um, Brian, why don't we address um, the elephant in the room, which is what's been going on with the banks recently? Oh, Starting off with the, uh, the the big questions, aren't you, Cam? I, I was hoping you were just going to be happy that, that we've got some green lights today in the futures and everything else. But uh, we'll we'll dig right in. Um, essentially, we've we've had a, a big change of things. Now we'll kind of recap a few things in the past year uh, that have led up to things. Naturally, the pandemic led to a lot of spending. Uh, a lot of spending led to some inflation. So last year, our topic was always resounding on inflation. Now with that, the main way that central banks can combat inflation is by raising interest rates. And when they raise interest rates, essentially what happens is any bond or any fixed income that is owned longer term goes down in value. So essentially that is a recap of what has happened. And now what we need to look at is how a bank really operates. A bank operates by taking deposits and then having loans out for the longer term. Now, sometimes those are loans in the form of mortgages, and other times they might just own a longer term government bond. They only have to have 10% of those deposits held at the actual bank so that you can take them out and everything else can be actually invested for those longer term investments. So now all of a sudden, if you have a bank that has $100 billion, $10 billion has to be accessible, $90 billion can be invested for the longer term. Not a big deal if people are keeping their investments in there. But what happens is, with the recap of what's happened in the last year, when those interest rates went up and the bond values went down, a lot of these banks' actual balance sheets went down significantly. And when they went down significantly, they don't have to represent that um, to everyone unless they need to sell it. I, it remains an unrealized loss and the money would come back um, just with a lower interest rate over the course of time. But what we've seen is a few banks that have had a little bit of a run on the bank scare. And before we dive into uh, uh, the, the run on the banks that we've had recently, Brian, why don't we actually go into what a run on the bank actually is. Um, so, so if we go on to our next slide, we've got a nice little graphic here, which actually explains what is a bank run. So, so why don't we walk? Um, our I, th audience. I thought we were going to go to movies from back in the early 1900s. Uh, you know, <laughs> like it's a wonderful life or something. I, I thought this was going to turn into a Christmas themed uh, uh, piece. Dad, why don't you take us through that, Cam? Absolutely. So as, as Brian was alluding to there, we've had, uh, what is it now, three banks at this point in the States um, that have uh, gone under and, and one which has uh, been forced to, to merge with, a, with another competitor. But again, before we get ahead of ourselves, that's, that's for later. Um, but essentially, a, a bank run is when, again, all the clients uh, go to rush uh, well, in a rush, actually, um, go to the bank to to take their cash out. Now, as Brian was alluding to there, uh, most, if not all, banks don't actually have one hundred percent of the reserves sitting there in you know in a in an old fashioned vault 
uh, in the basement for for you to 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 go in there and take your funds out. Um, as Brian was alluding to there earlier, a lot of these funds are actually invested, um, depending on the the duration, in other securities. Um, now, what's different this time round um, has been that you know compared to two thousand eight, I suppose where banks were probably investing in slightly riskier assets. This time round, um, for the most part, they've just been in in U.S. Uh, U.S. Treasuries and U.S. government bonds. Um, but as Brian was mentioning, when you have a mismatch there, um, well, all of a sudden you become a bit of a forced seller. Absolutely, and 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 what we have to remember is these three big banks in in the states. Well, one of them was big; the other two were were quite insignificant. Most of us couldn't have named them before the crisis. Um, two of them had more to do with cryptocurrency, so exotic banks that do different types of banking. And one of them uh, was mostly uh, dealing with uh, venture capital and startups over in Silicon Valley, hence its name, Silicon Valley Bank. So uh, all of a sudden, when you have uh, the majority of your clients having big assets that are sitting on the bank, it's easier to actually perform that run on the bank. It's if you have $100 million in an account and that moves out, all of a sudden you have to change your reserve system much quicker than if everybody falls under the FDIC limits. So um, these are not your typical banks. There's what, 4,600 banks in the United States? Most of them are regional banks that would do the typical functions and take care of mom and pop shops and mom and pop themselves and their deposits remain under the FDIC limits, so they don't have to worry about getting their money out. It's those deposits that are over 250000 that become um, the scare factor. And that's what really happened there at Silicon Valley Bank, was that the panic led to huge withdrawals. That led them to selling down pieces of those bonds, realizing those losses. And that forced them to take those losses and then go bankrupt, go insolvent. Um, at, at this point in time, the majority of banks won't have that problem, even though they own those same long term bonds, because there's no reason for individuals to make a panic on those banks. Got a perfect explanation there. Um, and hopefully that's explained or, or shed some light on, you know, how we've had a bank run in, in sort of the 21st century, even though, you know, many would think that this is something, as Brian was alluding to, uh, you know, something for the history books there. Um, but as we're going through this presentation, um, ladies and gents, please feel free to, to put your questions in, in the Q&A and chat function as well. Um, so why don't we move along on to our next topic at hand, um, Brian, which is, uh, you know, despite this backdrop uh, of, of volatility that we've seen in some some of the issues and again, some of these select banks uh, that we've discussed, um, how is the overall market actually looking uh, against this backdrop here? Well, there's two sides of, of functions because uh, essentially, first of all, when you're raising interest rates as a central banker, the whole point is to tighten things up and kind of turn the wrench, but you try to turn the wrench until you break something. Now, I think conventional wisdom was that interest rates would go up, unemployment would then go up, consumer spending therefore would go down because it's hard to spend money if you don't have a job, and that would bring inflation down. Um, it's happened a little differently. We've seen a lot of headlines stating that Big tech firms are letting go of people, et cetera, et cetera. But really, the unemployment rate hasn't actually uh, moved up at all. So this becomes that catalyst that could this be the thing that got broken from the central bank bankers raising rates? And that's alluded to this movement where a lot of people are believing that interest rates will be going down within the end of the year because the central banks will have to react to that, and inflation is coming down uh, somewhat, which is bad news has turned into good news from that factor. Now, my general belief is that when we think of uh, Credit Suisse going, getting bought out by UBS, Credit Suisse was riddled in problems. The three banks in the United States uh, were riddled with problems by having 
exposure to to risk that they didn't hedge appropriately. Um, so they were just bad banks from from that vantage point, um, and bad banks do go bankrupt. I, I, I believe you you pulled up a, a great slide that was showing the number of banks that went bankrupt during 2008. And uh, what was it 460 something? Yep, between uh, 2007 and 2008, I think it was just shy over 460 um, that actually went uh, went under, which uh, again, it's a huge number. Huge number. And we're, we're at three banks going under right now. And what we were looking at the FDIC list. Do you remember how many? There, there, there's a, a, a list of number of banks that are a systematic risk to the system of going under. And how many were on that list at this point? I, th I think as of uh, this morning, when we checked the FDIC website, there were 52 uh, banks on there, uh, which were on the uh, CRS compliance list from, from the FDIC. Um, now, again, just to add to what Brian said, it's not that these 52 banks are going uh, are at risk of collapse uh, today, next week, or tomorrow, even next month. It's just that these are banks uh, that the FDIC has flagged for one reason or the other, um, whether it be risk or, or anything else. Um, so just, just putting that out there, it's, it's, you know, if you see your bank on, uh, your bank's name listed on there, it's not, uh, uh, something to panic right away, but maybe it's, uh, you know, something to, to look at and, uh, think about, well, uh, other banks that you could be banking with. Um, but back to you, Brian. So, uh, so I think, I think, I think the main thing we want to get across is, well, this has definitely changed the theme of, of the year. Um, based on going from uh, that typical topic of, of inflation to how are the banks going to going to get through um, these problems? These problems are going to hit a few banks significantly, but um, when it comes to our overall portfolio, our overall portfolio has more investments in large banks than it does small banks, and the large banks are net benefactors of everything that's going on. When Silicon Valley lost. All those deposits, most of the people fled to the large banks that were too big to fail. The UK branch got taken over by HSBC. Um, I think uh, what was it? JP Morgan took on something like forty forty billion dollars worth of deposits in in the week after Silicon Valley Bank failed. Um, so they are the benefactors that they're not having to search for capital in the same way. Whereas the smaller regional banks. Um, are getting hit, and some of them are going to be a great opportunity to purchase because essentially um, they're they don't have that same level of risk. You know, like like we said, two of them are cryptocurrency banks, and one of them was in exotic financing and 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 such um, or deposits for um, uh, venture capital and startups. So different levels of risk. Um, some of those regional banks are going to be great purchases. But the majority of our portfolio are in those banks that are going to be benefactors. The question is, how long will it take them to benefit from this? Because uh, uh, essentially, uh, consumer sentiment can drive things in, in many a ways. And that's what we, we need to be cognizant of. People's behavior can change based on uh, what's going on uh, around them. And... Um, that can be a good thing and it can be a very, very bad thing at, at other times. So mm -hmm. um, essentially every weekend that goes on that we don't have bank failures or runs on banks um, brings us back to stability. Um, we had both the, the Swiss regulators and the U.S. regulators respond extremely quickly knowing that they needed to uh, after 2008. So they ring fenced many of these problems. Uh, including all those issues at, at Credit Suisse. Um, and uh, uh, I, I believe that they're going to be able to keep this from being any kind of major storm because banks are much better capitalized than they were back in 2008. And we have regulators that are paying attention uh, to getting these fixed very quickly because they're not all problems that were caused by those banks. Mm -hmm. And one of the things actually that's that's been quite surprising, I, I should say, 
um, despite this backdrop, Brian, is um, you know some of the resilience that we've seen in other parts of the market, right? Especially uh, tech, which again last year uh, has taken a bit of a beating, and and particularly emerging markets and 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 China as well. Uh, again, which has been uh, you know you know one of uh, one of our stronger strong standing convictions. Um, but what are your thoughts on on the the behavior you're seeing on you know a lot of the strength in some of the other parts of the market, despite this ongoing uh, you know, turmoil in, in the banking sector specifically? Well, the consumer's still strong right now. Um, the, the consumer's still spending. Unemployment's still really quite low. And, and that is coming out in the whole, in, in the whole schism. Um, mm. and, and it's even more so when it comes to China. Because, you know, naturally we had the reopening at the beginning of the year <clears throat> where essentially COVID lasted a little bit longer there than, than it did any place else. So the reopening... Remember last year when uh, basically everybody in Europe and the United States decided we're going to go out and spend money because we finally can. The savings rate went up significantly during the pandemic, and that excess money got spent right back into the into the marketplace last year. The consumers remaining really strong, and the Chinese consumer is proving to be coming back. Well, the numbers have come down a little bit from what the earlier projections were. What are we what are we looking at? GDP growth of five percent. Five percent is the the stated figure, uh, and well, we'll have to see if they actually get to that by the end of the year. But from a lot of the policies they're enacting, it looks like they're very determined to to achieve those numbers. Absolutely, they'll do everything they can. But we'll take every little piece of good news in in in, in stride to the direction that we want it to be. And in in my view, the the big news in China has been from one stock. Do you, do you want to dig into that one stock? Yeah, absolutely. And and this is actually more of a recent um, uh, headline piece uh, than anything else, which is, um, you know, Alibaba, which is, again, one of the the larger companies in China. And, and many people view that as, you know, the Amazon of, of China. Um, essentially, they've announced plans to break up the conglomerate uh, and, and, you know, uh, spin it off into six distinct uh, segments, which, are, again, investors seem to be loving that news. Um, and, uh, you know, it remains to be seen whether they can actually execute and, and how far that would actually take the, the value creation going forward for shareholders. Um, but I think that's been a, a huge um, sort of, uh, you know, tailwind uh, for the sector as a whole uh, over there. And, and we've seen a, a nice rally over the not last few days. Um, but I'd be curious to get your thoughts on that, Brian. And, and I know you've had strong uh, opinions on whether tech companies are worth more, uh, you know, as as a sum of their parts or, or broken up individually. But uh, would love to get your thoughts on that. Absolutely. Every investment banker always look at this process of of, of looking at a waterfall in in the valuation of of an overall firm. And um, you know, to me, some of the best examples, and and it actually works perfectly with Alibaba because. Uh, naturally, you bring up that it's the Amazon of China, and yet one of their big units is the cloud unit. So you can make the parallels back to Amazon. AWS is the most profitable unit over at Amazon, whereas what we think of as at Amazon being the the, um, the the guys that bring you the box <laughs> that you order online is actually not all that profitable for them. So if you separate those two companies, one's going to get a much higher higher valuation, the cloud service company, than the one that's a, a little bit of a loss leader that's the legacy company. Um, when you go even deeper into that, well, if you think of uh, you know products like their uh, their their music service or their TV service, those are totally loss leaders. So all of a sudden, if you separate those you might be able to segregate and get bigger valuations than you are as having a conglomerate. Now, this happened for uh, for uh, the, the major oil companies 100 years ago, for AT&T, whatever it was, 40 years ago. Um, and, and I believe that big tech is going to go through that same aspect uh, from, from that vantage point. It's just interesting that it's happening in China first. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, I was expecting it really to be taken off by the European regulators and the UK regulators to force the hand of everybody. Um, they forced Facebook to get rid of their meme company <laughs> or they're trying to. 
Uh, oh. Absolutely. Um, and, and just to play devil's advocate there, you know, the question, I, I would say the jury still remains out there of, you know, whether you could still apply the same model of, of standard oil, oil being broken up versus, you know, a lot of these tech giants where, you know, one could still make the argument that maybe the value creation lies in the ecosystem itself uh, and, and you know, rather than the, the sum of its parts. But again, you know, we're, we're seeing this play out in real time in, in China, and maybe that might just be the blueprint for a lot of these tech companies uh in in the west as well but uh, again the jury's uh still out there no, no no matter no matter what way we look at it we enjoyed having a 15 percent day from alibaba which was one of our biggest positions in in um in some of our different chinese funds um so it it, it is good news from the vantage point of value creation in in the immediate term uh, absolutely that's uh that's without a doubt um, conscious of time, so so we're going to be moving on to our next topic at hand, which um, has been the currency and um, what's going on with the dollar. Uh, it's had a, a, a huge ride up uh, to the upside last year, been being again being one of the largest benefactors of uh, interest rate hikes last year, and uh, it's had a bit of a road bump this year uh, coming into this year, I, I should say, Brian. But what are your thoughts on the dollar? for this year and uh, uh, the, the years ahead? So well, well, let's let's back up a little bit on the dollar just a little bit because we've, we've gone over it a lot in the past of, of the historic valuations of it that we typically have 10 to 15 years of dollar strength and then 10 to 15 years of dollar weakness. And this is a little bit purposeful. Um, during hard times, excuse me, during hard times, we typically have a flight to safety and the dollar is one of those safe currencies. Uh, right now, the safest currencies are Norway, Sweden, Switzerland, and the U.S. Uh, the U.S. is the biggest of those four markets. And um, therefore, the majority of the flight to capital goes to the U.S. Um, that being said, the times of dollar weakness are more, more just a, a, a movement to normality instead of uh, a, a devaluation of the dollar. And we are getting some normalcy. You know, we we went through winter time. Europe was supposed to be a basket case because of not being able to get uh, natural gas and and, and oil um, and and the likes. Uh, we had a mild winter, and gas prices and oil prices have come right back down. Uh, so so things have normalized. So the developed world is not in as bad of a situation as we could have been or expected to be six months ago. So that's where some of that normalcy comes out. And then on top of that normalcy from a geopolitical vantage point, you have interest rates, which we've joked about it many a times that the U.S. goes first and raises interest rates the most. What do we have? Nine hikes over in the U.S.? Yep. Um, then the U.K. gets to go because they're the U.S.'s lapdog. Um, then Europe next, then Japan. And when China finally does it, we call them currency manipulators. You know, that's that typical waterfall that we have on interest rates. Now, the U.S., we raised, they, they raised interest rates, was it last week or the week before? You'll remind uh, me. Last week. Last week. They, they, they raised it by a quarter of a point. Um, could have been 50 basis points, but quarter of a point, still an increase. But the assumption is that we're getting near the top to control that inflation for it to come back down. Whereas the ECB, the European Central Bank, raised by 50 basis points, i.e. they're playing catch up. So yeah, they're, they're third down the line, but they haven't gotten to those same levels. Now, all of a sudden, which Josh is going to talk a little bit about, we're finally getting some interest in Europe, and we're finally getting some interest in the UK, mm -hmm. i.e. interest on your savings and on your bond. And that means if you're a UK individual or a European individual, you can actually move your money outside of US dollars and earn interest. That flight to capital, uh, a flight of capital is going to balance things out. And that's what we're really seeing. Right. Things are evening out. You don't have to just be in the almighty dollar to do so. That being said, this is the greatest thing that we could have in the overall stock market. The main reason being that most US companies do a lot of business abroad. If we look at the S&P 500, 40% of their earnings, 40% of their revenue comes from abroad. If you look at the tech companies, and the tech companies are the ones that got beat up the most last year, 60% of their revenue comes from abroad. 
So every time the dollar goes down, those earnings are worth more in dollar terms. So the best thing for the U.S. stock market is for the dollar to come down some more. And we believe that it will continue to come down as long as inflation continues to show signs of coming down over on the U.S. side, but that the U.K. and Europe and, and the likes have to continue fighting it over here to catch up on those interest rates to alleviate that that um, that horrible inflation that we've been dealing with for the last year. Mm. So, so just to tie everything, I know we're getting to the halfway mark here at this point, Brian, but just to tie everything and bring it back to, you know, some of the changes that we've been making in our clients' portfolios and, and what have we been looking at, um, maybe if you could provide a bit of color onto, onto that aspect of some of the changes that we've been making uh, and what are we more uh, most uh, interested in or, or most excited about when it comes to certain parts of the market? Absolutely. Absolutely. The, the, the portfolio has been going through some some nice little shifts. Um, naturally, we're not uh, negative on value, but we don't see it having that place that it needed last year. In other words, inflation is coming down, so value stocks are not as attractive as they were. Um, whereas our growth stocks got hit so hard last year, increasing those while we're at lower valuations is wonderful. And the the devaluing dollar is helping us. So we're going more towards a balanced approach of, of the amount of value and growth that we have instead of having an over allocation of value. When we started that position a couple months ago. Um, so as, as Cam has on there, we're adding to growth and tech companies uh, inside of our portfolio, making sure that we're, we're primed for recovery on those side um, and X US dollar positions. So we're buying both emerging markets and uh, anything outside of the U.S. to take advantage of the lower dollar. Now, fixed income to me is the most important part here um, because uh, for the last 12 years, as we've run our strategies, we've mostly had our fixed, um, fixed income in the United States, which has been great because the dollar has gone up. Therefore, whether you live in Europe or the U.K. Uh, or any place else with a higher dollar and having U.S. fixed income, uh, that equated back into euros or pounds as a, a net gain plus higher interest rates. Now, as interest rates move up in Europe and the United Kingdom to levels that are close to the U.S., not, not fully at the U.S., we can remove that currency risk for that side of the portfolio by buying local bonds. So we're buying UK bonds and European bonds in portfolios, but we're still keeping them short because we expect more rate hikes over here. We're not buying five or 10 year bonds. We're keeping it one or two years to, to be able to, to move them up. Um, so this is the first time you're seeing those inside of the portfolio, but a good thing to have. Mm -hmm. I think you almost stole uh, most of Josh's thunder there on, on the fixed income part. So uh... Uh, All right, Josh, Josh, if you're still listening, I hope you've got some, uh, yeah, some extra notes in, in the back pocket there, but <laughs> we'll, we'll be getting onto that shortly. Um, perfect. So I, I guess our next topic at hand, um, again, I don't think any uh, update is complete without, uh, you know, uh, commenting on what's going on in the ESG space. And I know we've had uh, a lot of developments both uh, on, you know, on both sides of the continent here in Europe, as well as the US. Um so if we could uh, get Isa up on here, uh, our resident expert on yeah. all things ESG, uh, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to dive into this a little bit uh, uh, in more depth. Um, so Isa, a question to you. What's actually new in the ESG space and particularly uh, what's been going on in the US when it comes to ESG? Yeah, so uh, there's been quite something going on in regards to ESG lately in the US. Um, actually, President Biden has for the first time used his veto right recently since Congress had uh, introduced an anti-ESG bill. Now, this bill was aimed at prohibiting pension funds um, to consider ESG um, impact or ESG related issues in their investment decisions. And um, this actually comes after already 17 states in the U.S. have um, have implemented an anti-ESG bill or introduced something to that extent um, to yeah, make sure that pension funds are not considering ESG too much. Yeah, so 
Oh, go ahead, Brian. Go ahead, Kim. Kim. No, 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 no. You, you go ahead. <laughs> so this impacts really the pension funds, Isa. Um, mm-hmm. It's not people's regular investments, but this can be quite problematic at times because yeah. you could have the nurses and doctors who have to take the Hippocratic oath, right? And they could end up not being able to exclude cigarette stocks from their pensions. Mm-hmm. So all of a sudden, it's taking out that whole universe and it's saying every pension in those states has to only be concentrated on how much they're earning, what their profits are, and that's it. Is that is that a correct analysis? Yep. That hits the, the nail on the head. So coming back to that, but then how does that actually impact the end clients? Brian, I know you've touched upon the fact that, you know, right now this legislation only affects those uh, large pension funds out there. Um, so, you know, potentially the, the nurses, the doctors, et cetera, um, and, and many others, you know, might not be able to um, know that their uh, investment managers are taking these considerations into account. But what does that actually mean to the actual underlying investments and, and to ESG as a theme uh, going mm-hmm. forward? Yeah, so of course, um, the larger ESG funds, so so funds that are focusing on ESG topics um, mm-hmm. could be impacted by that um, in regards to their in and out flows. So of course, pension funds do have large investments in these kind of funds. And if they are prohibited from investing, that will impact the underlying funds, which are funds that everyone can invest to as well. Got it. And I think, it, you know, it, it, Brian and, and Isa as well, I think, you know, we've been having this conversation on ESG with, with many of our clients and, and uh, you know, other, other outside stakeholders as well. And it's, it's become such, uh, you know, for, for what it's actually trying to represent, it's become such a divisive topic. And mm-hmm. again, without getting into the politics too much, um, you know, regardless of which side of the fence you sit on, I think, um, you know, Larry Fink, uh, who, uh, for those who don't know, is the um, CEO, uh, well, the current CEO of BlackRock, uh, or better known uh, as as the um, company that runs a lot of the iShares funds. Um, and I think he put it uh, quite aptly, which is, you know, stakeholder capital- capitalism shouldn't really be about politics or um, uh, social ideological agendas. And it's certainly not woke as, uh, as some uh, other people are, are trying to uh, make it out to be, but it's really capitalism that's driven by mutually beneficial relationships um, you know, between the end investor, employees, uh, customers, and, and various other stakeholders in the supply chains and, and communities, and and that's really what capitalism is is actually about. But um, again, I'm sure it, it's it's not a topic that's probably going away anytime soon. And you know, I think uh, both sides of the fence will probably continue to to dig their heels in, uh, and you know, we'll have to keep a close eye on this. Well, I, th- I think I think that's a, a a wonderful point, Kim, and I and I do think it impacts some clients, because if you have a pension back in the States and you don't care about ESG, it's not an issue. But if you're passionate about it and that pension's held in one of those 17 States, it might be a reason to review that to see if you want to take it out of the pension, because any of your personal investments, you still have the right to invest them any way you want to. So this is only impacting those pension funds. Even if this becomes a full repeal on the on, on the U.S. front, let's be honest. Anybody that's resident in in Europe um, is under the new rules in Europe that ESG should be evaluated. So Europe's becoming heavily re- regulated when it comes to ESG, and the United States it's become that contentious issue. But you still have the right to invest it any way you feel is appropriate for your situation. Absolutely. Wonderful. So moving along, I think our next uh, couple of topics, why don't we jump into that right now, uh, which is, you know, we've uh, we've touched upon the the uh, banking uh, issues. We've touched upon the wider market uh, a little bit there. Uh, and now we've touched upon ESG as well. So again, bringing it all back in, I know, Brian, you were alluding to a, a little bit and stealing Josh's thunder there. Uh, on on fixed income, um, but why should clients actually care with uh, some of the developments that we've seen, particularly when it comes to higher rates, um, the inverted yield curve, and such that you touched upon, Brian? Uh, 
uh, and maybe Josh, if we can bring you into the fold here. Um, so talk to us a little bit about fixed income and why is fixed income back? Well, first of all, Brian, I don't know, is it hypocritic or Hippocratic? I was never really sure which of those it was. That the, the, the doctor said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so kind of what we've been talking about up to now is, you know, for those who have been following along in previous updates, you'll hear this refrain a lot where the Fed will start in the US, following on the UK and then Europe, and then eventually the punchline of China doing it and everyone says the currency manipulators, right? Uh, that's kind of the same thing we've seen playing out lately. Uh, naturally, last year was a lot about the US raising rates uh, quite a few times. We're starting to see uh, the UK really begin to do that in earnest. And uh, I mean, I'm not going to read out the chapter and verse of each sort of right there, but you can see that Europe is also sort of trailing behind that as well. Just all that to say, um, this is an interesting time to be looking at fixed income opportunities. Um, and as much as it was last year for the US, it is still now. But uh, yeah, for those of us that are across the Atlantic, either in, in Britain or on the mainland, it's well worth looking at what opportunities are out there, either from a savings account perspective or you know the bond opportunities. Um, so, so sorry to sorry to interrupt here, Josh. Let's, yeah, sure. Let's break down this graph just a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. So so essentially, on the x-axis, we're looking at the time period of the bond. So how mm -hmm. long you're holding the bond, right? Right. And then the y-axis is the interest rate that mm -hmm. we're receiving on the bond. Right. These are all the current market prices of what you'd get right now. Mm -hmm. Now, just a reminder for everybody listening, those European bonds last year, the short-term ones especially, those were negative. Right? That's the drastic difference that we're really seeing. So Europe's coming off the floor there. Whereas uh, uh, essentially everything's normalizing to to nearer term rates instead of or nearer to each other rates, whereas it was last year negative in Europe and positive in the United States, hence the flow pushing up the dollar, mm -hmm. hence the view that the dollar would come down. Sorry, I wanted to define those two for the mm -hmm. X Y just for no, the oh for sure. And uh, another good thing to mention there is. Um... Another reason why that we think this is also a good time of it is sort of as, as you can either tell here or if you are also privy to our newsletter where you've probably learned a lot about bird legs lately. Um, we've been seeing that the yield curve is still uh, well, it's, it's inverted, which is basically for just to keep it brief means that we're looking for opportunities on the shorter end of things where it's just looking a lot better from that that the rates that we see now to be looking at you know one to two years instead of 10 to 15 is really just the tldr as tam would say um cool uh so following on from that in these types of times now naturally we want to know where it makes sense to have the cash in the first place okay so uh i think uh so cam if you'd be so kind as to scoot over to the next slide cool so this is all talking about bonds and such now if you have spare cash on the side well what can you do with it, right? Well, sort of tackling the things on the US side first, during these types of times, cash is not all the same. Now, one way of looking at things is to look for opportunities in the, the money market side where you'll there will be things like the government or tax-free municipal bonds. Uh, these generally don't break far away from par value, so you know, don't expect to be buying at a deep discount or anything. But on the plus side, they do keep you away from banking facilities if you've seen the news lately and understandably just wanna just keep away from that. It could be especially preferable if the spare cash is over the $250,000 FDIC limit, which is another positive there. Um, alternatively, even if you have over that amount, uh, I wouldn't say that that's necessarily the only option. Now, what we can do in our brokerage accounts, for example, is just we can spread out the, the funds in up to five different banks, for example, as you can kind of see in the illustration there on the right-hand side, just to make sure we're staying within that limit across each institution thereby still being within the FDIC limits. It's just a way where if you have that spare cash, and especially if you don't necessarily need it right away and it can be put to work for you in the, the shorter term, again, looking at the, the yield curve in that sort of way, mm -hmm. then bond and CD ladders are still very attractive in that sense. And uh, those aspects offer those returns while you know staying in those bounds of the FDIC. So just something that we can have uh, your money working for you. And what's now? I mean, it's a really interesting time uh, compared to the last ten years or so. 
And and what about for our clients on the other side of the pond, Josh? Mm-hmm. Uh, for for our clients in in the UK and Europe, um, mm-hmm. what are sort of the coverage limits there? And and mm-hmm. if they're above those coverage limits, um, what options do they have? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So this is yeah. So thank you for that. Yeah. So it really depends on where you're at. Obviously, now in the UK, you've got up to eighty five thousand pound per institution of, according to the financial services compensation scheme. Uh, the EU is hundred thousand euro. European deposit. So these are basically, you know, just keeping it real high level. This is something that's similar to the FDIC limits. Um, now, I would kind of pose the question back to you guys. Let's say they do have that over that limit. Um, what are you guys' thoughts on the sorts of opportunities there are out there for people in those sorts of ways? Well, I guess the first aspect is, uh, you know, if you've got more than eighty five thousand in one bank account, maybe maybe you should be looking at a, a opening mm-hmm. up a second bank account at, at a mm-hmm. different institution. I think uh, between Europe, the UK, um, uh, you know, there, there's there's more than one uh, large bank uh, that offers services to to, to various clientele. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's probably the first and most easiest aspect to look at. Um, but again, as as Brian was alluding to, and and as you were alluding to there, Josh. Um, you know, given that rates in, in Europe and the UK have also uh, steadily started to increase and, in, you know, with the prospects that Europe is uh, Europe and the UK are probably going to be catching up very, very soon to the US, um, you know, other aspects might be to look at, uh, you know, here in the UK, um, guilt and, um, you know, in Europe, uh, various sovereigns uh, of, of various countries, um, which again, you know, could also be uh, options rather than just letting it sit in a savings account, which may or may not be giving you uh, much, if any, in the way of interest. What we have to remember is that these are protections against a a, a total bank failure. And uh, essentially, the majority of people shouldn't be sitting on substantial amounts of cash for inflation reasons, as we've gone over on on so many of these past uh, uh, webinars. So uh, essentially, if the biggest fear is that all the banks are going to go under, well, we should be looking at alternatives to making sure that they're protected in those types of ways. But we shouldn't be sitting on more than those amounts in any given bank, just because sometimes we have those black swan moments uh, that can catch us by surprise. And this is our way of protecting ourselves and from that. Mm-hmm. What, what's the expression, Brian? Just because I'm paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get me, right? I might have said that a few too many times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you may have possibly said that one too many times. Um, perfect. Uh, I think we're getting right along uh, time here to open it up for Q&A. But before we dive into Q&A, uh, we just want to round off uh, the, the whole discussion on uh, sentiment and in particular the consumer sentiment. Uh, so if we move over to our next slide, um, Brian, why don't you graciously do us the honors of explaining what is the consumer sentiment? What does this chart that we're looking at represent? And um, what does this actually mean for clients? There's there's a million different ways that people measure consumer sentiment. The most, the most famous and longest course one is from the University of Michigan, uh, where they call, I can't remember if it's a 500 or a thousand different families at random and um, basically ask them a series of questions to see what their views are on the economy, whether they feel like they're gonna be more prosperous going forward or not. Now, through those questions, basically they rank them. And um, as you can see, the average is uh, 85% or 85.6%. And um, anything below that is considered negative uh, consumer sentiment. Anything above that is considered, considered really high sentiment. And um, as Buffett says, you want to be greedy when people are fearful and fearful when people are greedy. Uh, Historically, the S&P has done the best when consumer sentiment is at its worst. And as you can see, we are coming off those low levels that we saw back in 2008. We're at those same types of levels, and we know what recovery we had from 2009 until uh, last year. So uh, historically, we would see the stock market performing really well when consumer sentiment is really negative and consumer sentiment is really negative right now. Perfect. 
Wonderful. I guess that wraps up um, the the update itself. Uh, and at this point, I think we'll we'll open it up for for Q and A. And as we're moving on to Q and A, uh, we'll we'll end off on a, a quote here from Mark Twain. Uh, don't know why it's there. It just happened to be prominent, so we'll we'll leave that there. Um, as mentioned, um, please put your questions either in the Q and A function or the chat, and we'll get to that. Uh, and again, bringing back the the whole conversation. Um, which is, you know, we want to be focused on the forest and not just the trees. And, and in this particular example, you know, I think the analogy is pretty apt that, you know, despite the ongoing um, banking issues between a, a few sporadic banks, they they happen to be the trees and not the, the entire forest itself. And, and that's what we really want to focus on. And um, as we're giving the audience here a couple of minutes to, to get their questions together, Brian, I, I had one question that was actually emailed across here. Uh, before we were able to join, um, which was um, particularly, what is it about China that we really like uh, that has us very optimistic? And uh, to help you out here, uh, maybe I might jump onto uh, our slides uh, when it comes to the forecasts on inflation, unemployment, and GDP growth. But I'll uh, I'll let you take it from there. So Cam and I were driving through Italy, as people do. <laughs> And um, I started grilling him from country to country uh, uh, about different aspects, not just inflation, but inflation is very important. Um, and it was basically we were going through GDP growth, uh, money supply. We were going through population. We were going through inflation forecasts and unemployment. And Unemployment. Thank you. I couldn't think of the fifth. And that, that, <laughs> you come in to save the day as usual. And, and basically, we started breaking it down. And <clears throat> when it came down to it, um, any developed market looked quite attractive when it came to low unemployment. It looked quite attractive uh, when it came to, uh, well, actually, no, everything else looked pretty unattractive because GDP growth was quite low. We were looking at ones to one and a half. Mm -hmm. uh, we were looking at inflation that was quite high. Uh, it's the, the GDP chart here, just for GDP reference. Growth, there we go, yeah. There. Um, so GDP growth, you can see right there, zero to one. Um, Ireland looks pretty attractive there at 4%, but 4% should not be, it's not anywhere close to the 5 6% that we've been seeing from, from China over the longer haul. Um, so essentially, we were looking at GDP growth low, Unemployment's low, which is good. We're looking at money supply not being great because, well, we're having to actually take it out of the system. And um, that just left us at a, a negative sentiment for most developed markets as being hugely attractive. Whereas China, on each regard, looked like a developed market, not an emerging market. But when we broke it down, inflation was quite low and money supply was still positive. So all of a sudden, we know over the course of time, China is going to go from being an emerging market to a developed market. You know, I, I would make the argument that half of it is a developed market and the other half is an emerging market. It's just you can't play half of the Chinese market. So... When we, when we really kind of break it down in that way, the only thing that makes China unattractive is the geopolitical risk, um, especially with the new portions uh, when it comes down to, to Russia and the such. So we're not looking at making a purchase of China in the same size of the portion of the market cap to the greater portion. We're just saying it should be a bigger portion than the average consumer has because there's more upside to the downside of the geopolitical risk. Mm -hmm. Even more so, uh, you'll remember the, the one that we, we spent a lot of time analyzing. Um, we were talking heavily about South Korea. We, we were, yes. Yeah, South Korea has, I think, has been... Uh you know, a conversation that's cropped up a lot more uh, frequently. And and uh, again, I'll chime in there a little bit if you don't mind, Brian. And and just for the audience out there, um, when you typically think of South Korea, you, you, you would 
you would hazard a guess that it's very much a developed market economy. Um, and and in, in reality, it, it is. But when it comes to the actual investment landscape, um, MSCI still classify South Korea as emerging markets. And the reason, again, is very nuanced and, and there's many reasons, one of them you know, being that uh, short selling is very restricted, capital flight uh, is, uh, uh, sorry, capital controls is again, also very restrictive. Um, but that's uh, you know, been a, a particular segment of, of the region that we've been very interested in. But at the same time, I think the largest uh, company that, that uh, pretty much represents South Korea is, is Samsung. So really it's a very heavy concentrated play on, on Samsung uh, in that regard. Um, and, and Brian, I'll let you chime in with, with your thoughts as well on that matter. Well, yeah, uh, Samsung makes up about 25% of, of the index. So all of a sudden, if if you end up buying it, we could just buy Samsung and mostly have that same aspect. Um, again, it plays into China because if South Korea were to, to move up to become a developed market, um, which there's a high probability that that could happen if they can get some liquidity into the market there. Emerging markets would most likely represent the same exposure in people's portfolios, and South Korea is one of the most attractive emerging markets for many. So China would become the beneficiary of the majority of that, because let's be honest, most people can't invest in Russia or won't invest in Russia, which is probably not a bad thing. South Africa has been a basket case. Brazil is a little bit more of a commodities play. And India costs about as much to buy as it does to buy American shares. So most people are looking for other plays, and yet it might become more restrictive if that were to move up into the developed market index. Um, so, so things to watch. I think June is the time that they make the changes over there. Um, so, so it could could come along in uh, in near order, but um, a, a very interesting place to to keep track of. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, and and one question actually that was sent in anonymously to to me here right now, Brian. And uh, again, this is a bit of a, an elephant in the room. Um, and the question is, would you mind expanding on uh, why Credit Suisse was forced to, to be sold over uh, or well, merged into UBS and, you know, what the bigger impacts there are, if any, on, on the markets? And maybe I can see if I can pull up that slide on, um, you know, our, our, our internal discussion about Credit Suisse uh, no longer actually, well, having much credit. Well, uh, cre Credit Suisse has had, had its problems for over a decade. I mean, I, I find the most interesting thing about Credit Suisse is that it was bigger than Apple in 2007. It was worth $90 billion in 2007. Um, and uh, it, it, it seems since then, it has just faced problem after problem, even since the merger or since the announced merger with UBS. Um, today, we have uh, an announcement that Credit Suisse was helping Americans evade taxes. Well, we've heard that many a times over the last decade. Uh, on Friday, it was uh, going against Russian sanctions. Uh, essentially, it, it was a classic run on the bank because they had a lot, a lot of liabilities on their hands and the, the customer deposits were just flowing out. Um, and then on top of it, the CEO lied about the customer deposits being closed out and they got sanctioned for that. So when all of a sudden your balance sheet doesn't represent what you need uh, to pay out to your clientele that are making the run on the bank, you end up having uh, a net loss exposure. They were getting backed by the Saudi prince, the Saudi sheik, and the nail in the coffin was that he said he would not be helping him bail out any further. Um, and that led to the final run on the bank, which led to the uh, Switzerland coming in and saying they would backstop, what was it, 50 billion euros? Uh, it was 54 billion euros of uh, emergency liquidity that they provided uh, to Credit Suisse in the final days, um, which naturally didn't do much to alleviate uh, concerns from, from the actual clientele. Um, and then eventually, well, as we all know, that led to the uh, the shock and wedding uh, between the two largest uh, financial institutions of, of Switzerland. 
it's uh, it's going to be very, very interesting times. Um, for UBS, it, it could probably be very accretive because uh, it looks like they're still going to they're going to um, spin off the investment banking unit from Credit Suisse, the, the old first Boston. Um, but they'll poach off some of their favorite teams that they'd like to have on on there. Mm -hmm. um, it will be accretive for the wealth management portion, uh, but there's going to be a lot of duplicate functions. Uh, this is a huge merger when it comes to personnel. What is it? 70,000 employees at UBS, 50,000 over at Credit Suisse. Yep. Um, so we could see probably a uh, five figure uh, loss of jobs between the two institutions based on duplicative uh, services over there. And um, that will affect significantly Switzerland and London. I think they have 5,000 employees just at Credit Suisse, just here in London. So uh, this, this will impact the banking sector in significant ways. It will change the whole uh, mode of how Swiss banking is done because there's no longer two key players. There's one main player. Uh, but I don't see it as a precursor of, of more things. Last weekend, there was talks of Deutsche Bank being hit hard. There's a huge contrast between Deutsche Bank and Credit Suisse. Deutsche Bank made $5 billion of profits this year. Credit Suisse lost $7 billion last year. That's a huge difference um, when, when you break that down. Uh, and, and that's to where uh, Bank of America, Citigroup, they were very quick to say, hey, Deutsche Bank is fine. We don't understand why these, these calls are coming out. Um, and we didn't hear any news over the weekend. So I would expect that to continue for the next couple of months, that we're going to hear a lot of rumors and there'll be probably a lot of attempted runs on banks. Sadly, uh, the hedge funds and, and a lot of others try to profiteer from, from these types of things. Um, but most of the banking institutions are, are quite strong, um, despite having bonds that have gone down in value. Perfect. And I think we're, we're coming right in for time uh, here at this point. And uh, I don't believe we have any other questions in the chat or uh, in the Q&A box here. So with that done, um, once again, I would like to thank everybody for taking the time out of their schedules uh, to tune into our webinar. Uh, again, we will be sending out a follow up uh, to everybody that signed up and, and everybody that didn't sign up. Um, you will also include a um, copy of the slides, which again has a, a, a lot more uh, slides that we didn't cover and a lot more topics in the appendix that we uh, just didn't have time to to go into in greater depth. Um, but with that uh, out of the way, um, once again, thank you all for for tuning in and thanks to to Brian, Josh and, and Isa for, for their wonderful insights and um, have a wonderful rest of the day. Thanks so much, Kim. Thanks, everyone.